Great, over to you, Sai. Thank you, Alison. Um, all right, so then let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Hi, hello, everyone. Once again, welcome. We are honored to have been able to attract enthusiastic audience this evening. And I'm very excited about the conversations we will be having shortly. For the past eight years, UK university students from ethnically minoritized backgrounds have developed and implemented trailblazing anti-racist movements in order to transform their education, as well as to critique and change the social conditions surrounding their education. Widely known projects include, why is my curriculum white? Roads must fall and young historians project. Hence in the UK, the current discussion on decolonization is centered around powerful student activism in higher education, which has led librarians um, to generally consider that our decolonizing work has been a response to these students. However, in 2020, around the time when I attended the decolonizing the curriculum, the library's role conference at Goldsmiths, I started to wonder how did the decolon recent decolonizing initiatives in libraries and archives start? Rose Must Fall was in, in Rose Must Fall in 2015 was certainly a trigger, but can I trace its broader history? So I started to explore the librarianship literature about ethnic diversity and racial inequalities in the UK, published during the 2000s, 1990s, 80s and 70s. One of the books I came across was a public library service for ethnic minorities in Great Britain by Eric Claw and Jacqueline Quamby from 1978. I have to say, I was quite dismayed by reading this book. This research was initiated by School of Librarianship, Polytechnic of North London. Whereas it provides information on public libraries of the time, wanting to become more multicultural and support the diversifying population, the research shows at the same time some very problematic stereotypical understanding of community cultures and there is also a tendency to avoid directly denouncing racism in British society. Next slide, please. How should I contextualize what is written here? I really wondered, and that led me to read more broadly, in particular, the literature of Black British history. At this stage, I noticed two things. Firstly, there has been archivist strong contribution to black history research. You can see the name of Hannah Ishmael on this list. It's a shame that she cannot join us today, but her brilliant dissertation is open access for everyone to read. And Sarah Garrod, she is the archivist of George Padmore Institute. Secondly, I noticed the potential of unlocking a British focused historical narrative of critical librarianship. Down the list, you see the article titled A Poverty of Thinking, originally published in Race Today in 1973, reprinted a few months later in Library Association Record. The next slide, please. Here's a quote from the article which criticizes systemic racism within public libraries. But in 2022, I think we agree to apply this critique to other institutions, not just public libraries. This 1973 article is intriguing in the sense that it contains many of the topics we have been discussing in our current decolonizing work, such as 
critique of whiteness, discriminatory classification systems, need for building anti-racist collections, and the British information sector being a challenging work environment for staff members of color. Next slide, please. So far in my research within the mainstream librarianship literature, I've been finding comments on lack of ethnic diversity in the sector throughout the past five decades from 1970s to 2020s. Here I wonder again, I understand that black and Asian archivists and librarians have been a minority group, but how can I learn more about those who went beyond the barriers and were doing their work. But this next step to find specific names of archivists and librarians of color has not been so easy when it comes to those who worked in the pre-internet era between the 1960s and 90s. Having said that, however, I've been coming across very interesting names of people who can be seen as pioneers of our decolonizing work. A. Sivanandan, who was director of Institute of Race Relations, started his career in the UK as a public librarian after moving from Sri Lanka in the late 50s. The great poet Linton Kwesi Johnson spent his time in the 70s as librarian writer in residence at the Keskidi Center. And Ziggy Alexander. She was librarian, researcher, local authority worker, consultant, active during 80s, 90s and 2000s. Next slide, please. Today, Ziggy seems to be remembered in history and health communities. She was the co-editor of the republished autobiography of Mary Seacole, which inspired then professor Elizabeth Aini Ongu, founder of the Mary Seacole Center. However, when we dig a bit deeper, we learn that Ziggy's work spans widely from history, librarianship, culture to business and health. We see her trying to advocate for the benefits of people, especially women of color. I must say we know too little about the work of this very talented black feminist. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to come back to my first slide by adding, yes, the student activism since 2014 has definitely encouraged us to become more visible in organizing and participating in decolonizing work, but anti-racist activism in British archives and libraries has a longer history and goes beyond the higher education sector. So I'm eager to learn more about the movements developed across different regions in the UK. We can think of the present and future of our decolonizing work in connection with this past. And that I believe is very empowering. So this evening, we are hoping to create an opportunity for archivists and librarians to bring our knowledge, experiences and networks together. Um, next slide, please. On that note, it's my pleasure to introduce two emerging archivists, Rebecca Adams and Shanique Thompson, to share their insights through their presentations. Rebecca is the first presenter and Shanique is the second. Um, Rebecca, please briefly introduce yourself to start your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, as previously mentioned, um, I'm Rebecca Adams, and I'll be talking today about decolonizing while we work, and specifically from the perspective of an archivist. Next slide, please. So um, I work at the London Metropolitan Archives. I'm one of the archivists there. Um, the London Metropolitan Archives is the principal archive of, of um, the city of London and the greater London area. Um, the documents date as far back as 1067 um, up to the present day. 
Uh, we have documents, um, we have parish records, hospital records, businesses, charities, livery companies, um, and community archives. Next slide, please. Um, I am currently working on the Africa Centre collection um, at the London Metropolitan Archives, but previously I was working on the Molly Hunt collection. Molly Hunt was an educational psychologist from Guyana, um, and she was one of the few black female educational psychologists in the UK. Um, she was a teacher in the 1950s in Guyana, and she decided that she wanted to move to the UK in 1961 um, to continue her higher education. Um, she set up a large number of Caribbean organisations for to advocate for Caribbean families who at the time uh, were seeing uh, their children being sent to what was then uh, named um, educational subnormal, but now what we would call special schools, and they felt that they were disproportionately being sent there. So uh, Molly co-founded and founded um, the Caribbean Parents Group, the Caribbean Parents Group Credit Union, uh, her PEV consultancy and the Westview Academy, which were all um, created to advocate for um, Caribbean families and their children. Um, next slide, please. So I thought I'd talk a bit about um, the collection. Um, <clears throat> so in the collection, it's very much a both personal and business collection. Um, it um, shows Molly, um, a kind of Molly in many different kinds of lights. It shows kind of the things that she did, but also the obstacles that she faced during the time which she was working, which was from the 60s um, um, to, to early 2000s. Um, so there's personal records, there's business records, there's also audiovisual material, there are um, VHS tapes, for example, and cassette tapes. There's also casework, um, which connects to um, the young people that she worked with as she worked within the London Borough of Brent and Ealing, um, where she worked as an educational psychologist and she um, advocated for children and assessed them and worked with many families um, within the borough. Um, next slide, please. So to talk a bit more about kind of decolonizing the archive and the ways in which I personally um, uh, thought about um, decolonizing specifically the Molly Hunt collection, um, I very much was thinking about um, decentering whiteness and bringing agency to the Molly Hunt collection. Um, as it was more about thinking about me as an individual and what I could do um, with the Molly Hunt collection, it's very much, um, thinking about how we can decolonize as archivists while we work and the processes that we go through from when the collection comes to the institution to right to the end when the when the uh, collection can actually be accessed by researchers. So I think we need to think about as archivists um, the powers that we actually have over um, over the collections um, and over kind of what the depositors um, give institutions um, and how we actually think about archiving, also thinking about the collection itself, um, where it's come from, um, how has it got here, um, what period, time periods was it um, created, um, was it very much from a colonial lens, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's definitely what I was thinking about when it came to decolonizing and thinking about specifically the Molly Hunt collection. Next slide, please. So I thought um, one of the very important processes that happens is the appraisal process. This is the um, National Archives definition of the appraisal process. So it's thinking about how we assign value, what we decide to keep, what we decide to um, uh, weed, what we decide to kind of not have within the collection. Um, and that's obviously a very important process because we have to think about what actually, what we view as valuable for a particular collection. Um, but when I was actually working through the appraisal process, I had to think, okay, who, is this collection actually serving? Um, who in the community is this collection serving? Um, what's actually interesting for researchers? Um, and kind of thinking about not just um, what I deem important to, to keep, but also what others within the actual process will find interesting to also keep. So this was a very important, especially as I'm a, a black woman, Molly Hunt was also a black woman, but she was also working through a different period of time. I couldn't put my own 
ideas above hers I had to kind of think about we work in different time periods while we are from the same community we, we also have different um ideas and different viewpoints at that time um so I can think about that as well um next slide so I also had to think about the cataloging process um <clears throat> and how the cataloging process can be used when it comes to um, thinking about decolonizing. So I had to think about um, language and terminology, um, the language that, was, that I would use when I was cataloging. In the Molly Hunt collection, it's very much connected to um, mental health and disability. And there was a lot of archaic language and racist language. And I had to think about um, uh, the ways in which this was harmful, uh, what I would keep, disclaimers that I would use for um, eventual users and researchers, um, the ways in which language is actually changed, for example, in terms of how we would describe someone who who is is um, disabled or or someone who 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 has other, oh, for example, now we would use you know neurodivergent, for example, it's kind of thinking about language in that way. Also, the wider catalogue how the Molly Hunt collection connects to wider areas of the catalogue um, at LMA was also important as she was connected to a lot of different activists at the time and quite a few of the activists were actually at LMA thinking about how that would connect to different parts of the, the collection as well and the language that was used there. But also um, communication. Um, I know that lots of different archivists catalogue in lots of different ways. However, I think it was very in, important for me to be able to communicate with different archivists and different colleagues um, and understand their point of view. And, and sometimes that could actually help me when I was cataloguing um, in various areas of, what, of um, the collection that I was working on when it came to Molly. Um, next slide, please. So, in summary, um, I think when it comes to decolonizing the archive and decolonizing while we work as archivists, I think we have to think, rethink and, and kind of keep on rethinking the um, appraisal process. Um, we have to think about um, decolonizing collections, but also making sure that we don't put our own ideas above um the the individual who has has given in the collection who has deposited the collection with the institution and how we'd actually um and kind of using all different kinds of perspectives um sure i am a black woman and i'm working on another black woman's collection but i can't put my own my own views and feelings above the individual who i'm who i'm working on and and also critical analysis when when kind of cataloging archives is also very important as well Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rebecca. That was wonderful. Really interesting insight. Appreciate your uh, contributions there. <laughs> Great. OK, so we'll move on now to our second presentation, which is from Shanique Thompson from Goldsmiths. Um, so Shanique, all yours. Hello, um, so I'm Shanique Thompson and I am the Special Collections and Archives Assistant at Goldsmiths University of London. Um, I come from a varied background of not just um, like the library and cataloging and archiving work that I'm currently doing, but also fashion design, teaching and programming. Um, so I've got a lot of skills that I'm kind of reworking to suit my new role. So within special collections and archives, we have quite a variety of archives and special collections, ranging from physical objects such as textiles, image slides, vinyl records and videos, all the way to photography, documents, rare and special and artistic books. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, that is our email address. Next slide, please. Um, in general, special collections, um, archives and libraries are brimming with the potential to be inclusive, inspirational environments. This, however, will take time, collaboration and impassioned work and adaptability so that the ideals and concepts that we cultivate can be maintained for the future. It is both inspiring and empowering to see not just action being taken, but also collaborative work going on between researchers, lecturers, educational establishments, communities, students, and graduates. It is also important in building the foundations of a new type of education and information sharing society. We all have a responsibility as instigators of change, but truly effective change takes time and support. So today I want to talk um, about contextual reframing. Um, so I'm going to be looking at a variety of um, items that we have in the collection. Unfortunately, um, I had to whittle it down to only a few. 
So um, I hope that you find them of interest. Um, next slide, please. So this book is a good example of contextual reframing and a reminder that decolonizing is not the removal of objects, items or information. The original was written by someone who didn't display a deep understanding of the culture and viewed their customs in a derogatory way. But there is still value in the preservation of information. And so in later iteration, in, in later iterations, more context was added in the form of insights from different people who had a relationship or understanding of the culture and the stories in order to reframe the content, but to keep the information but alter the contextual lenses through which it is viewed. Keeping both books so that nothing is erased because it is not what decolonizing is, but also giving researchers the opportunity to actually reflect on the developments within literature. Next slide, please. Um, so there are a variety of examples of reframing the very archiving and special collection system of practice, challenging the indoctrined concepts and providing a novel approach as representation and innovation are key in challenging exclusive ideals with the hopes that if you are the first, you will not be the last. So the Rita Keegan archive is a new addition to the collection, even though Rita Keegan herself is already featured within the collection in other um, areas of the archive. It is a good example of a creative person who did ex who reframed through action. Not only did she work through creative mediums to create her own work, she also brought together marginalized groups to collaborate and document their works, journeys, practices, and so that they remained a part of history. She was she also advocated and encouraged the concept of being your own curator of your own work. Next slide, please. So this leads me in to the Women of Color Index, which was started by Rita Keegan in 1987 to collect materials, including slides, newspaper cuttings, posters, and ephemera, neatly documented and organized. There, this was done as part of her work with the Women's Artist Slide Library, which is another archive collection we hold at Goldsmiths. It was also done in collaboration with the African Asian Visual Artists Archive. The index brings together work from um, Asia, the UK, the West Indies, Africa, and the USA. It was, it was, um, it was you. It was also used in two thousand and nine as part of a larger project. The index has been documented in a way that reflects the communities it aims to preserve the voice of and catalog and in cataloging we have to ensure that we preserve those voices and so we try and link to the individual artists so that it can be made easily searchable but also accessible and we are preserving the narratives that Rita tried to preserve when she created the Women of Colour Index. Next please. So these are just some of the examples of, it's quite a large index, so I couldn't put all of them on the screen, but these are just some of the examples of some of the fantastic um, images we have of the work. Next slide, please. So to see yourself reflected is more than inspiration. It is a foundation to build upon, a community to shape, and a movement to be a part of, the opportunity to change the future. Decolonizing brings to light that which always had value but was overlooked because of the indoctrined mindset of colonialism. The Women of Color Quilting Network was founded in 1985 by Dr. Caroline L. Mazalumi. We are lucky enough to have the newsletters from 1992 to 1995. The group is a non-profit organization which aimed to connect a community and support their creative endeavors. It documents a diversity of culture through craft narratives, a connected community. It is another good example of how communities can be connected and empowered through the sharing of information. Next, please. So um, it was very simply made. It was all photocopies. It has lots of newspapers and ephemera within it, but it's a wonderful example um, of how we can share information. And I think it's a fantastic part of the archive because it's just another way of archiving people's stories and making sure that marginalized groups don't get forgotten or written out of history. Next slide, please. 
So as we move forward, we continue to reflect and grow in order to improve our own practice for the future. One element which is important in our collection and archives is capturing the voices of the artists themselves. As part of the textiles collection, which is another element of the special collections, we have an annual award called the Christine Risley Award. In 2019, the Christine Risley Award was awarded to Farah Riley Gray, and she curated, created an exhibition surrounding hair within the black culture, um, misogyny, rituals of high textiles, weaving, examining the ways in which materials can convey relationships within culture of race and gender, engendered product making, as well as the potential to hold dysphoric stories absent from other historical archive sources. I think it is important um, in contextual reframing where we ensure that we capture the voices of the artists and save this information alongside the objects so that it reflects in our catalog so that we get a real essence of not just what an item is, but how it came into being and make it more accessible for everyone to see, but also so that it is truly what the artist created. And like my colleague said, not just our own opinions and reflections on it, even though those are, those are equally as important, but when cataloging, it needs to be the artist's words. Next slide, please. So um, that is not the only new addition that we have to our archive. We also have the deconstruction and reconstruction project. The deconstruct reconstruct project was started in 2021 as part of um, a decolonizing project at the Special Collections and Archives by Adia Jalan. Um, the decolonizing project, if you'd like to read more about it, is on our Goldsmith blog. Um, it was directly inspired by the 1980s community led community-based London art project and exhibition, Community Copy Art, organized by an art collective based in King's Cross. It was a photocopy-based exhibition on the theme of Black women's experiences of living in Britain. And that archive is part of the Women of Colour Index. So this project was Adia's reflection on her experience of exploring our, our, the, uh, some of the items in our archive and an inspired movement, and in particular, the idea of copying and copying yourself into history as a cheap and accessible medium. So Adia created her own exhibition and research based on this theme. This project is now part of special collections and archives. And on the screen, you'll see a quote directly from um, Adia about this project. I think it's really fan a fantastic example of how impactful ensuring that we preserve these voices, but also make them accessible and also that we work, the work that we are doing to ensure that there are opportunities for people not just to access, utilize and reflect, but also influence the way the archive is developing. Next slide, please. So I would like to leave you with this quote from Rita Keegan, where she says, I'm sorry, next slide, thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to leave you with this quote from Rita Keegan, where she says, I felt like archives wasn't about me, it was about the different people. It wasn't about whether I liked work or not. It was about the work, was that the work was there. It needed to be archived, it needed to be made available. I feel that this quote is amazingly poignant in describing how important it is to we ensure not only to preserve the different voices, especially those of marginalized groups, but also that in archives and special collections and libraries, it is not about our personal likes and dislikes. It is about ensuring that we preserve and make available, but are also do not lose the elements that are important to the cultures, societies, communities, or artists in order to try and authentically preserve the voices in a way that may not have been done for um, specifically because of the exclusion of marginalized groups in the past. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Shanique. That was a fascinating insight. And I really appreciated all the photos as well to get a bit of insight into the collections, even though we couldn't be there tonight. <laughs> um, so that was really two really fantastic presentations, both two people who are fairly new in the field. We're really grateful to them. 
Um, so what the plan is now is we're going to be walk, uh, moving more into the panel discussion. Um, so we'll be um, calling upon Ma um, Shanique and also on Rebecca and then Marilyn as well will be joining in in this section. I'm just going to lead a few guided questions. Um, as before, please feel free to put any comments, thoughts, questions in the chat, and then we're moving into the Q&A after that when we'll have a chance to address some of those questions. Um, so Rebecca and Shanique have already introduced themselves. Uh, Marilyn, would you like to introduce yourself now very quickly? <laughs> Hi, thank you, Alison, and thank you to Shanique and to Rebecca for really fantastic presentations. Um, my name is Marilyn Clark, and I'm the Director of Library Services at Goldsmith University of London. Great, thanks, Marilyn. Okay, so I'm going to kick off with a few questions. Um, so Sai sets us off this evening talking about the importance of the years 2014 and 2015 for librarians of archivists, thinking about the why my curriculum is white, the roads must fall, the young historians project. And obviously there was also a joint SILIP, our um, information workforce survey summary published in 2015, which was one of the first to point to some of the really dreadful statistics related to diversity in our joint profession. So let's sort of go back in time, almost 10 years ago to 2014-15. Could you just talk a bit about where you were um, in that period and what you were doing then? Um, so Marilyn, let's start with you. 2014-15. Um, so I hadn't I hadn't arrived at Goldsmiths by then. I started Goldsmiths in 2016. So I wasn't on a library management team. I was at Imperial College London, which was is a science uh, technology engineering institution which wasn't really my kind of chosen field but that's where I spent a lot of my my career in libraries at Imperial and yeah it wasn't I think you know issues around inequalities and lack of representation were not things I was you know a, I mean I was aware of it because I was a very you know in a minority I was a minoritized person a racialized minority in a very white space um, but I wasn't aware of anything that was going on to address that or redress that lack of representation and and I didn't really see I didn't really have a sense of agency as to how I could change that and I think you know at that time I was aware of student movements not in the UK but in predominantly in South Africa where that call for change was you know was beginning to happen was happening probably wasn't just happening you know in that year it was happening for quite some time because of um apartheid and what things looked like you know once apartheid came to an end in terms of representation in um south african universities and who was teaching on those courses and what was being taught so that was kind of what i was doing i mean that was those are the things i was aware of i had knowledge but i wasn't in a position to make any change at that point so 2014 2015 was just on the kind of year before I shifted into Goldsmiths and where I really found found myself you know being a very much an active an active um, member in in terms of what was happening with student movements and what we could do as libraries mm. but yeah before that it was just like I'm very marginalized here I feel very disempowered and didn't have much of a voice at that point. Thank you, that's great. Um, and Re Rebecca, what about you? Obviously you weren't really in the field at that stage, but sort of in 2014-15, what were you up to? Were you aware of the student-led protest movements at the time? <laughs> yeah, um, I was. I, I was actually in my second year at Goldsmiths. So I did um, English and History at Goldsmiths at the time. Well, I was on the second year of that. And I was kind of, I guess I was I was I was I was kind of aware of it, but I was kind of moving through and trying to kind of decide what I was doing with my life at that moment, at that moment. Um, I was kind of in the middle, just thinking, oh gosh, what should I do? You know, what 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 do I what, what do I think is actually something that's really important? Um, and actually, I think that 2014 was when I kind of learned, started learning more about archives. Um, and that yeah actually yeah 2014 yeah 2014 was when I actually learned more about archives and that was when and then I went into and then 2015 was actually when I I volunteered where I'm actually working now and that's when I learned more <clears throat> um, <clears throat> about um black archives and I was like oh gosh this is amazing I didn't know about this before and then I kind of moved into lots of different things so I guess 
I was, I was, I was in kind of my own little bubble at the time, but I was very much kind of becoming more interested and more uh, aware of kind of like black, black history, black archives at the time. Because I didn't, I hadn't really, I hadn't learned about it in school. It was very much kind of slavery and then, you know, America. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what was happening for me at the time. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't really part of your educational experience at all. Yeah, until later. Yeah. Um, Shanique, what about you? When in 2014-15, were you aware of the student protest movements at that time? Or what were you up to at that period? Oh, you're on. Sorry. At yeah. that period, I was just finishing my um, teaching degree. And so I was um, I was thinking about um, marginalized groups and representation, but from the perspective of being a teacher in a pupil referral unit where predominantly the children there are black and they are usually male. And so um, I was thinking about representation because for a lot of them, they didn't have anyone telling them, you know, you can do other things, you can make it or any examples of kind of people to look up to or things in the past that could suggest to them that they could like there was nothing that they couldn't do and that sometimes somebody has to start it if you think it's important and so I was beginning to kind of research and look into things so that I could have lots of um, people to say oh have you heard of this person Shanique you're on mute Shanique you're on mute Have we lost Shanique or is it? Uh, yes, it looks uh, like it. Um, yeah. she'll, be, she'll be back, I think. Yeah, okay. I wasn't <laughs> sure if it was my internet. No, it's not so, your yeah. computer, Alison. <laughs> it's always my computer, so it's like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay, no yeah. Um, so let's ask Marilyn, Marilyn a question while we wait for Shanique to come back. Marilyn, what were you sort of thinking in the context you had sort of growing activism on one hand, but on the other hand, you had a lot of information of workers, information workers of colour continuing to be placed in a marginalised position. So did you have any thoughts at the time? In 2014-15? Yeah, so that sort of they got the growing activism, but also mm -hmm. you've got this report saying it's 97% white or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, when that, I mean, that's, you're kind of stuck with that figure in your head, aren't you? This 96.7% white. And I guess, you know, it was a question of, of, I think it was a few more, a couple of more years before we started seeing some real shift in trying to sort of address that. And, you know, as a profession, and that was through, um, you know, the conversations and, you know, a lot of fantastic work by Shirley Yearwood Jackman uh, as a SILIP, trustee and then setting up the SILIP uh, BAME network and that I mean I was on the steering group for that I think in 2018 and then the group you know the network was actually came into came into um, creation I think in 20 I think 2019 get my years all mixed up but yeah I think it was around 2019 so we actually had a space for black and brown you know library workers to get together to be, you know, to form a community where that community didn't exist before. And then also the Sconnell BME Forum as well came into existence around the same time. So it was quite, you know, it was a, a few years later that we be began to see some call for change and some call for representation. But I think, you know, obviously it's sad that it, it took so long and we're still not at a place where I think that statistic is, is much different. I think seven is it seven years ago? Six or seven years? I don't know how how it looks now. Probably not much different, and not that that's just the UK experience. I know it's you know almost as bad in the US um, when it comes to representation as well, and particularly in in more senior positions as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean. It, we're at, I, you know, in terms of that, we are at the beginning, but at least we are talking about it now and we're trying to make change and we're putting in things like positive, positive action graduate traineeships, which we've, we've created at Goldsmiths. We had our inaugural traineeship, uh, graduate traineeship uh, this year, and we want to be 
continuing with that work uh, on an annual basis. So giving that opportunity for people who maybe never thought about entering the library and information sector to have an opportunity to come in to work in a library for a year across all, you know, a range of teams to get that experience to see, uh, can I see myself here, you know, in this particular profession? So it's given, making opportunities like that available too. So that's, that's something that we've done at Goldsmiths and I know other libraries are trying to um, put traineeships in place as well. Yeah, I think the King's Fund has another one, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. King's Fund inspired us. They were mm -hmm. the inspiration, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's great, thank you, Marilyn. And I see that Shanique's back. Shanique, did you have anything you wanted to carry on saying, oh, you got cut off earlier or are you, uh, shall we move on? <laughs> Are you good? Oh, I think you're... yeah, it's fine. You're fine. Okay, cool. All right, um, I'll pass it over to Mary now, who's got a few questions for the panel. Hi there. Um, so I have a question. Um, Student-led activism in Britain, focusing on decolonizing the curriculum, has been in resonance with the wider international anti-racism protest, um, such as Black Lives Matter movement, and also national initiatives against racial inequalities. Um, such as the Windrush scandal and the impact of COVID-19. Um, thinking about your life and your work from 2014 to the present, um, to what extent do you think you have been influenced by these social movements and developments? Um, you can ask Rebecca first, if that's okay. Um, these movements have definitely um, influence kind of um, the work that I've done and kind of the work that I want to continue doing. I think it's very, um, it, it, I think with these movements, it very much um, is rooted in kind of wanting change, um, wanting change, realizing that actually there's, there's something wrong, something needs to be done. Um, and it's, and I think in terms of that influence it's it's very much about kind of thinking okay something something needs to be done me personally I feel like we definitely need to encourage more um um black and Asian um individuals and 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 kind of and people of color in general to kind of move want to move into um the heritage sector um but I think there's obviously a lot of obstacles. There are a lot of obstacles in the way. You know, there's 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 funding. There's there's um so, you know lots of people don't have the money to be able to do the masters, for example, and and lots of other issues. Um, but I definitely think that that these kind of movements definitely, and also with the wind wind can't speak with the wind rush scandal and thinking about how we actually look after records. Um, how the, the records that we think are actually, or we as archivists in general, or record keepers actually, or we actually think is important, or we think is important to keep um, when it comes to thinking about um, um, uh, how we look after records, um, who we actually kind of think about and who we consult and kind of making sure that we all, that we can always bring in communities when it comes to thinking about um, different records and different collections. I also think that's very important, and that's something that also um, made me when it come when it came to kind of the Windrush scandal and kind of racial inequalities and thinking about anti racism. It's also about thinking about how we can um, change the ways in which we look at archives and the ways in which we look at kind of record keeping. How how we can actually think about how can I bring in anti racist practice anti-racist practices how can I actually think okay I have this view but there's there's other views that are actually out there that we also need to kind of bring in and think about to be able to um I think in my, in my perspective become better archivists I think practices are all very good but at the end of the day we're not all individually neutral people we all have you know preconceived notions you'll have different things that we think about and I think with, when these, with these movements, I think it came back up again, but, you know, we have to think a bit deeper about what we do and how we do things, rather than just thinking, that's done, that's the end of that, and wash our hands and keep it moving. So um, I think that was, um, that was something that really came up when it came to thinking about these movements, and it actually affected 
um, kind of what I do and kind of the work that I've done up to this point. So yeah. Thank you. Um, how about you, Shanique? Um, has uh, any of these social in movements and developments um, influenced you or your work? Um, yes, definitely, because it has, it's been quite wonderful in the sense that it's created a platform for it to be a discussion that you can bring up within every step of your practice and it's not kind of like a challenge or a fight and you're not kind of I don't feel scared to bring it up or that you know I'm going to offend anyone because I know it's important and now that it's out there it's kind of like there's a platform for it we're talking about this but have we considered the decolonizing element the marginalized groups have we made sure that we've captured those voices and so it's I think it's wonderful because even though like those movements have happened, I feel that they will continue to influence the way that we um, archive and work and share information, but also the way that people look for information and kind of look outside of the areas that maybe they would have felt confined to before they even maybe were even aware that there was something outside of those areas. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, Marilyn, I direct the question to you as well. Yeah, I mean, it It really spurred me on. I mean, I was, it shone a light on, you know, an area that we needed to tackle. And when I was, you know, began to sort of track what was happening and, you know, saw that our student union, what they were doing at Goldsmiths in terms of their work, uh, their student uh, movement work at Goldsmiths, inspired me and the library team to, to want to, you know, play our part. And we had, a, we have a, our current learning teaching and assessment strategy the, the first uh, objective of that is liberate our degrees and that came about because of the work of the student union at the at the time that policy was written and so for us it was like well you know how do we how do we meet this objective as as a library as a library team and so that that was you know the kind of impetus for us and also uh, we discovered that the student union had created some bookmarks which they were encouraging students to leave in books with suggested titles for purchase which were missing from the collection where there were where there gaps in the collection and a couple of the bookmarks kind of made it back to us but it wasn't you know we weren't picking up a lot of a lot of those bookmarks so we spoke to the student union and said well how can we do this in a different way and that's when we started the liberate my degree suggestions so we then set up uh, a process where students could make suggestions to identify books which were missing from the collection, predominantly, you know, marginalised hidden voices. And so we would then um, buy those books and began to create a collection, which is now, I think we've got over 400 items in that collection. And we've been collecting for about probably the last four years now, three, three and a half, four years. And so, you know, that was kind of the initial um, task, I suppose, when we first sort of found out what the student union were trying to do to decolonize the collection, as in, you know, we want to be able to represent voices which weren't there, which are, you know, were hidden, which were, rep and communities which um, are rep underrepresented. And as a con consequence of that, we then decided to create a working group um, and came up with an initiative called Liberate Our Library, which is still in existence. And as a consequence of that, we are looking not only at, you know, building that Liberate My Degree collection, but looking at information literacy uh, workshops where we are trying to sort of identify areas where, you know, we're, where we're having um, sessions on inclusive citation, being more critical in your searching when you're doing your searching across resources. So it's kind of ex expanded as well into, an, into the information literacy uh, work as well that we're doing. And also um, having discussions with uh, academic departments as well about, about the work that the library is doing and wanting to collaborate and get their ideas and get their input when it comes to looking at reading lists, for example, and you know, decolonizing reading lists and using that as an opportunity to work in collaboration 
with academics, with the teaching staff, with those who, you know, put the curriculum, you know, create the curriculum. Uh, we, as as a library, we can we can uh, we can support that. But I think what we wanted was, you know, to kind of build a, a stronger relationship when it came to our de decolonization work. I think at the beginning it was a, a slow slow progress, but now. I think as an institution, Goldsmiths is looking more generally at decolonization and decolonizing curricula, but also racial justice work as well. There is now a racial justice strategic board, which came about because uh, there was a student um, sit, not sit in, what's the word? <laughs> occupation. There was a student occupation of one of our administrative buildings, Deptford Town Hall, which lasted 137 days. And as a consequence of that, you know, we are now have this racial justice strategic board, which um, is looking at some of the recommendations um, that came after the end of the, the occupation and that the senior management team have, commit, have committed to. So it's really, you know, I just kind of want to draw attention to the fact that it was, really, you know, it's students, it's student activists who are you know, leading this, leading this primarily. And we are, you know, learning from them all the time. Um, so for example, there is a group of students at Goldsmiths called Ghost, who call themselves Goldsmiths Racialized Postgraduate Network. And they came about because the, the postgraduates didn't, you know, felt alone. They felt really invisible. And they then created their own network. They found out that, you know, they weren't the only ones you know, doing their PhDs or doing their research. So they've come together as a collective and they're working on their own reading lists and decolonizing reading lists. And so we're now working in collaboration with, with that network too. Um, you know, they're focusing on uh, particular departments. Um, I think we did some work with them on sociology. We're gonna do some work with them on um, a number of other subject areas, music and art. So it's not just, you know, the, the work is coming from the library and it is coming from the students as well. And I think, yeah, it's always important for us to be working alongside students and the working group, the Liberate, Liberate Our Library Working Group, we've always invited uh, student union sabbatical officers to sit on that uh, working group because we want to make sure that we, you know, keeping that connection and keeping that conversation going with the students via student union, which yeah, is, is key, is key in our work. And then, um, we had a, I think, I think Sally mentioned it in her, in her introduction. We had a conference back in 2020, January 2020, decolonizing the curriculum, the library's role, and we had librarians, library workers from across the UK come and speak and present on what they're doing within, you know, within their own libraries. And it's really broad ranging, and it's certainly not just you know limited to one or two libraries it's happening in a lot of libraries and a lot of institutions of course that's grown more and more over the years as the conversation continues and, and grows and expands but for us it was like well what can we learn from each other and nobody's doing this work in isolation as much as we can we want to learn we want to learn from the from the community so yeah as a result of that I think the conversation and the the collaborations have definitely grown um, since, and they are they are still continuing to grow. Fantastic! Thank you all for your answers. I'm going to pass on uh, the questions to say. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's great to hear all these stories and the different life moments, but we are kind of in resonance with each other. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, in the United States, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter movement said in an interview, we come from a long legacy of resistance and resilience as Black people. Likewise, um, within British um, Black communities, there are equally important histories of resistance and resilience. Well, thinking about the richness of your heritage, can you tell us what or who have been your inspirations and why they have been important to you? Shall we start with Shanique? Um, 
Um, sorry, just to clarify, do you mean in terms of my work in like libraries and archives or personally? Um, uh, whichever you feel comfortable to talk about. Um, so when I first studied at Goldsmiths, I um, had the opportunity to work with um, Rose Sinclair, who is a textiles um, teacher, education um, educator and um, artist herself. And it was really inspirational for me personally, because when I was studying at GCSE level, it was her books that we were given to study from. And I still have them now all through my teaching. I have used them and being able to work with her um, while I was learning to teach was so inspirational, but also later on when I did my master's, being able to work with her and she sat down and talked with me about my research and the way that I was doing it. And it really made me look at things in a different way. And I have taken all of the things that she's taught me um, so much further. And she's been so influential not just to me but also to my um, younger sister because she's met my mum and my sister because I went to some of her shows and I brought them along because my sister is hearing impaired and so I like to introduce her and show her different people who are also hearing impaired who are doing amazing things and so that has um, and she's doing amazing things now at the moment with um, Althea McNeish and um, all of the research she's done on like the um, black communities and like those marginalized voices and trying to bring those to light and it's so interesting to talk to her about it has really made me um question my own practice and my own research and really change the way in which I look at my own work and even the way that I kind of help and collaborate with others um so I would say she's been incredibly influential oh thank you for sharing that's like the boundary between personal and professional is sometimes really vague and they overlap each other and they, your story just <laughs> exemplified <laughs> my thoughts and I, I just felt so moved. Thank you. How about you, Rebecca? Sorry, I'm on me. Um, I think I'm also gonna talk about Goldsmiths <laughs> as well. Um, Cause I remember, <laughs> Uh, in my third year, I did um, Caribbean Women Writers with Joan, Joan Anna Maddo. And, um, and that was, I'm originally, or not originally, um, my parents are from Jamaica. Um, and my grandparents came to the UK in the, nine, the late 1950s, early 60s. And I hadn't, well, in, very, in various ways, I'd kind of heard about, you know, um, different you know the Caribbean and I'd been there a few times and kind of I'd never really looked into um Caribbean literature and I'm from that from the um Anglophone from the English speaking parts of the Caribbean and and Joan was kind of my first um look into kind of um Caribbean um literature and specifically Caribbean women women writers and that it changed my life <laughs> changed my life it it, it it changed kind of kind of what I did for my dissertation it very much informs what I do now in terms of um the work that I do when it comes to archives because um when I eventually ended up volunteering at the London Metropolitan Archives they have um the Huntley collection so they have um <clears throat> um Eric and Jessica Huntley there were um radical publishers and activists and there was amazing 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 people and they um they kind of they they did a, they obviously knew a lot of um Caribbean um writers and you know they've come up a lot in the collections and kind of that it, it it just all connected it just all connected really well so Joan was just Joan she was great she's she's great she's amazing um but kind of learning more about kind of my own heritage through literature um and kind of being able to explore that was kind of really really a kind of turning point for me um and kind of a really inspirational inspirational moment for me no but um in in general it, it, it was just like it, it, it i think that was kind of yeah that was genuinely that course 
was the, was the turning point for me, I think, in terms of what I do now and kind of why I think it's important and kind of, yeah, that. So, yeah, Joan, Joan's great. Wow, yes. Yeah, literature and just reading and learning from those voices and finding your own voice probably in those texts. Uh, that's really a special experience, which I'm also sort of experiencing in Stuart Hall Library. So mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> I felt very connected <laughs> to what you have just said. Um, all right, so let's go on to Marilyn. Thank you. Thanks, Say. Um, I think, I think, I think for me, I mean, it's lots of lots of things, you know, it'd probably be different things tomorrow if I think about the same question. Um, but I think when I, I mean, because I grew up, I mean, I'm probably a lot older than most of the other panel, panel members, but um, I grew up in, you know, in the UK and was educated in a very kind of small air you know small um, area out on the kind of outskirts of um, London where there was no there were very few black and brown kids and no black teachers and for me my sort of first experience of being taught by someone uh, like a black and brown educators was when I went to Birkbeck and I did a diploma in African Caribbean studies and then I went on to do a master's in race and ethnic relations and that that was my real kind of moment you know which really like that moment when I thought oh gosh I've, I've you know I found myself I'm being represented here I'm being taught by people you know who look like me and you know my, the people who taught on my on my um masters Af Aftar Bra and Barna Hesse they you know really opened my eyes and uh, yeah gave me that sense of belonging where I hadn't felt that before being educated here as a, a person of uh, mixed heritage. So it, sadly, it was, you know, at that kind of diploma master's level post, post my first degree that, that I, you know, found that, that sense of belonging that, and that representation. But, you know, it was also when I discovered Bernardino Faristo's first book, Lara, you know, which was published in 90, 97, I think, 97, yeah. And seeing, you know, think, thinking, wow, you know, it, this black British mixed race author, and now look at her, she's like, she's she's known around the world, thank God, finally at last, you know, people know of her and know her work, and she's doing such amazing work on behalf of um, black writers and black creatives. Um, so, yeah, no, she was another massive um, inspiration for me. And also music, music and always is, always will be, you know, for me, great inspiration. It, and protest music, things like dub, dub poets, Linton Crazy Johnson, Benjamin Zephaniah, June Binter Breeze, you know, talking about realities of being a black person in the UK uh, through dub poetry. And yeah, I've always, you know, a big music fan, big music collector. So, but protest music, you know, is something that it was an education and it, and it still is, you know, black music, rap, grime, drill, you know, we're still, we're still telling our stories through music because, you know, that, that is a main means, you know, to get, to get our stories out there, our narratives, you know, and are, are ignored in so many spaces. And it's through music, through literature, through art and creativity that we're able to kind of show ourselves and tell our stories and you know let people know that we're there we exist and we have you know important things to say um so yeah I guess those are just kind of a few things and then Paul Gilroy's Ain't No Black in the Union Jack when I read that as well that was like one of those seminal texts which you know is, is as relevant today as it was when it was published so you know having work and working at Goldsmiths we've got the Professor Stuart Hall building you know we've got a building in his name at Goldsmiths you know and the importance of you know his legacy is you know we're feeling that we feel that now it could be now more than ever given where given where we are in the in the world so yeah I guess those are just those are just a kind of a few things few inspirations that um kind of came came to mind when I when I looked at the question Yes, thank you so much, Marilyn. Well, wow, the breadth of <laughs> your knowledge and experience and so generous to share that with us this evening. 
Um, just, I just have to really submit deeply <laughs> because I feel so excited. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so, ooh, Alison, over to you. Great. Thank you, Sai, and thank you to all the panelists for that really amazing conversation. Um, it was really lovely to see, like when Marilyn was talking, I see Shanique and Rebecca were nodding away as well. It was really great. <laughs> so. Oh, yes. One thing I wanted to mention also, a recent thing, is um, an organisation called the Black Curriculum. I don't know, if you, I'm sure people have heard of them. And their focus is on, you know, black, getting black British history taught in schools, you know, which we, we're still... We're still not seeing enough about Black British history being taught in schools. It's mainly, you know, Black American history, mm. and not to take away the importance, you know, absolutely not. But you know, it's we're still in a space where Black British children don't know their history here in this country and the history of colonialism and empire, and that is something that is being stamped on <laughs> by our very own government. Surprise, surprise, and yeah, yeah. I yeah, I just feel like. The black curriculum you know they're a social enterprise and they've done so such they're doing such amazing work and i'm wearing their t-shirt hey <laughs> That's awesome. sorry i wanted to say that earlier i almost forgot <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. No, that's awesome. I loved it. I wish I'd seen that T-shirt before. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone. So now, yeah, I want that T-shirt as well. That's awesome. <laughs> um, we're it's over now over to the to everybody else who's here. We'd love to hear your thoughts, questions, reactions. Um, so feel free to pop those in the chat. Or if you want to speak out loud, that's also fine. If you use the, um, the reactions at the bottom, you can put your hand up and I'll be able to call on you. Um, but Mary and Sai, would you like to any questions that have come into the chat? Do you want to start with those? How about it, um, Mary? Yes, I think that's a good idea. Um, we'll just do it chronologically and uh, we'll try to post questions for all presenters. Um, we have um, the first question, which is uh, um, directed to Rebecca. Um, it's by Antoinette. Antoinette, sorry for the mispronunciation. She's um, 